All right, it's time for a more modern Dracula movie, although this is 28 years old. I can't even believe it. From Francis Ford Coppola, who, as you know, made the Godfather movies and Apocalypse Now. You know he made a Dracula movie. He made it in 1992. We're going to take a look at it, review it, analyze it, and break it down for its various messages about the Dracula myth. Let's take a hard look at this Dracula by Francis Ford Coppola coming up next. <music> So I recently re-watched this Dracula and I was actually struck by a lot of things and it surprised in fact at how influential this movie turned out to be. I remember at the time it was released in the early 1990s, it was received uh, mediocrely. It was panned a little bit, but it was accepted. There are some great things about this movie, some not so great things, and I think almost all of you will feel that when you watch this movie. The star power is here. You know, Gary Oldman plays Dracula. To me, that's a great casting choice. You have Anthony Hopkins as Van Helsing. He's got kind of a weird accent, but you know, another great British actor. This movie also stars Winona Ryder, Keanu Reeves, Curry Elways, and a number of people you'll say, oh, that guy, oh, and Tom Waits, the great American singer as Renfield. I need lives. I need lives for the master. Now, this movie highlights Dracula, and it claims to be Bram Stoker's Dracula, but that was actually a title choice by the studio because another studio actually owned the name Dracula. This is part Bram Stoker's novel. It's got a boatload of characters in it from the novel, but it highlights Dracula as an ancient crusader, you know, a warrior in the Crusades who fought against the Turks. His love of his life dies, commits suicide, because she thinks he has been killed in a war. He goes berserk. He, you know, rejects the Catholic Church. He becomes like a demon or a Satanist or something like that. And then that that's what turns him into a vampire who lives forever. Well, jump to the modern age, circa, you know, the 1890s, and you get the typical Dracula story where Jonathan Harker goes to Transylvania to sell Count Dracula some real estate. In the case of this movie, it's London. And of course, Count Dracula sees, you know, the picture of Jonathan Harker's beloved Mina, but he sees the picture and he says, hey, that's the beloved who killed herself. I think she's been reincarnated. I need to go meet her in London. This is my top priority. So this movie has a plot line where Dracula tries to get back with his reincarnated lover. In fact, that's actually the main plot line of the movie. There's other plot lines too, but that's the big one. And this movie is very melodramatic. I mean, this movie makes melodrama seem tame. There's so much over-the-top love affair, erotica stuff in this movie that that may annoy a lot of you. And at times it looks hokey. Tonally, it's weird. But they're going for, you know, this big love affair, Dracula's unrequited love that he's got to, you know, get back from Mina. And then you also have the vampire hunting in this movie with not only Van Helsing coming in and saying we got to go kill Dracula, not only Jonathan Harker, you know, trying to get revenge or trying to get back at Dracula for, you know, stealing his babe, but also the three vampire hunters. There's a lot of guys, a lot of masculinity going after Dracula in this movie, trying to get rid of, uh, you know, Dracula in London, who was a seducer, kind of stealing the women of London and these masculine guys including Van Helsing, don't like that very much. So you get sort of macho guys versus the ultimate seducer in this movie in the end. Now I find this movie is very weird for a lot of reasons. You know, the Dracula stories typically highlight infectious disease, Dracula as a symbol of infectious disease. Usually he's associated with the plague. In this movie though, Dracula is associated with sexually transmitted diseases. This comes up repeatedly in the movie, First of all, with Van Helsing saying it outright that syphilis and civilization go together. Blood, and the diseases of the blood, such as syphilis, that concern us here. The very name venereal diseases, the diseases of Venus, imputes to them divine origin, and they are involved in that sex problem about which the ethics and ideals of Christian civilization are concerned. In fact, civilization and civilization have advanced together. But also highlight in this movie is lust. And boy, is there a lot of erotica in this movie. It's all over the place, especially in the first half of it. The movie really wants to construct this 
virgin lifestyle versus the lust, sinful, and orgiastic lifestyle of, say, Lucy versus the virgin lifestyle of Mina. And Dracula as a seducer, well, what's he going to do? He's going to come take Mina's virginity. Early in the movie, it even highlights this, that Mina pledges herself to Jonathan Harker. They're going to wait until marriage to have sex. She's a virgin, he's a virgin, and they need to remain that way. And that's over and against her friend Lucy, who is, you know, sexually loose. She has three men she's courting in London. And when you get Dracula involved, he is the ultimate seducer who is going to, you know, take Mina's virginity and affirm Lucy's sexual openness. So the highlight here is, you know, all the themes of virginity versus sexual openness, chastity versus being lustful. And this comes from, you know, the Catholic doctrines on sex, you know, Coppola being a Catholic, at least nominally, he might even practice it for all I know, but all this stuff comes from the Catholic Church and Christianity in general. And there's a very strong theme that, you know, if you buy into Dracula's seductive ways, you too will lose your virginity, but worse, you'll have STDs. And you know what else Dracula brings is other perversions, particularly, and this is pretty weird, bestiality comes up in this movie several times. So in other words, this movie highlights the sexiness and the sexual aspect of the Dracula myth. Now, I actually think this movie is tonally at odds with its themes. I actually think the tonal elements of this movie say, well, look at the sexiness of the production of the costumes, of the sets, of the actors, and look at all the lustful sort of erotica stuff in this movie, and you need to enjoy it because you know what? It's melodramatic entertainment. I mean, the movie is attractive in a lot of ways and, you know, wants to stir up that attractiveness in the, at the filmic level. But thematically, you know, it's trying to warn morally against, you know, giving in to Dracula's ways and the seduction of Lucy and the seduction of the succubi and so on. That comes up in the ending of the movie, basically the last half an hour or so. So you get this weird sort of mix of don't look, but look, enjoy, but don't enjoy. This weird contrast that sort of is broken by, you know, the difference between the tonal elements, I think, and the thematic in this movie. Now, I was surprised in this movie, watching it again, as I said, by the ending, the look, the sets of Transylvania, they look a lot like Lord of the Rings and Mordor, which came out 10 years later. I have almost no doubt upon seeing this Dracula again that Peter Jackson watched this and was quite influenced by it. And also I think Guillermo del Toro was also highly influenced by this. I hadn't thought of Coppola as a horror movie director who had influence on later fantasy horror movies, even science fiction, but it seems like he did here with this Dracula. That's one reason why you might try to rewatch it. And while I think you will not like some elements of this Dracula movie, it overdoes things at times, it's too melodramatic, it doesn't develop its characters very much, there's no doubt to me that you'll find some flaw that will greatly annoy you with this movie. And to me, one of them was actually Anthony Hopkins' weird accent. I wasn't sure what he was trying to be, what nationality he was in this movie. You do not let your eyes see nor your ears hear that which you cannot account for. Nevertheless, I think you'll find several things that will delight you or inspire you from this movie. I give it a tentative recommendation. I'm not putting this in my What Makes This Movie Great series because I don't think this is a great movie, but it's worth considering because given all the Dracula stories we've seen, this one is probably one of the most melodramatic, as I've argued. Also highlights, as I said, the sexual aspect of the Dracula myth as opposed to these other Dracula movies, which highlight psychology or religious themes that are have nothing to do with sex, or especially infectious disease, pestilence, and plague, this one is less about those than it is about virginity and chastity and being with your one true love and all that sort of stuff, I, over and against sexual openness and orgies and bestiality and so on. Have you seen this movie? What do you think about it? Let us know in the comments. Please subscribe to this channel for more great movie content, analysis, reviews, and all that. Thank you very much. Have a great day.